from today. I hope that you enjoy it. I love working with containers. And I frequently say here at Maryfield, we're the container capital of the world because we all enjoy containers. One thing is they're very mobile. So you can change them out. You can do whatever you want to do. But we're concentrating today primarily on those plants that really thrive and do well in the summer, in the summer heat. And most will go into the fall, until frost. So grab your hat because you need that, OK? And the gentleman in the crowd, I suggest you grab your hat also. And um, by the way, there are mosquitoes. There are some of those things that make us a little uncomfortable when we go outside. And uh, some of the natural things don't work very well on me because I'm a mosquito magnet. And so I wear a hat in the garden all the time. And I spray the brim of that hat with DEET. Yes, I know, DEET is a powerful thing, but so are mosquitoes and ticks. So let's get past that. And I'm gonna slip this off while we do the show. Now, container gardening needs to be fun. And so I brought up this fun little thing because I was walking through the greenhouse. I have a great advantage here of being able to use what idea pops into my head when I walk past it. So I saw some of these funny little heads, part body too. And I said, hmm, what can I do with this? This has no drainage in it. And I will tell you everything I'm talking to you about today has to have excellent drainage in the containers. So I said, what can I pop into there that will just be a fun short term thing? Because this little container holds very little soil. So things won't thrive in there for very long. So I just put this little spiral juncus inside of here because it loves water. And it could be just a fun little conversation piece. Sometimes you just need conversation pieces, maybe for the table or outdoors where you're entertaining that will give someone a chuckle. Now, I do have to tell you that uh, earlier in the spring, uh, a lady has a really large concrete head that you can plant in and did have drainage. And so we put a number of these in that and she was so excited because this is out in her garden and it, it does have drainage but she keeps water in it. it's got plenty of soil so let's talk about the fact that this is a very small container as i say so many times we want our children to succeed at gardening and we want everybody else to succeed at gardening because when we enjoy something so much, we want to be sure that everybody else enjoys it. And with the, the COVID thing that we've been through and people at home a great deal, they're out in the garden, thank goodness, and they're taking their children into the garden, which is so healthy. But when you do that, particularly if they're interested in the, the vegetables, give them a container that is large enough that they can succeed with. Because when it gets really hot, small containers are very hard to keep watered. Plus, most of these plants need more soil than that, okay? So having talked about containers and the size of the containers that are so important, I wanna do a little inspiration and, and then we'll talk about some plants other than in the pictures and how I pot up containers. Okay, so let's let's go to the garden and I will say welcome to my garden again uh, because I spend a great deal of time in my garden. I did a lot there, a lot of filming there with short videos that we used on the TV show. And now I work with the marketing department to also 
create little vignettes and things that we use here. For instance, right now, we're bringing up pictures that I capture through the seasons. So in, in the next picture, I just want to share with you that we need to um, get a little festive now and then. And this is fun. And sometimes it just needs to be for you and your partner or your next door neighbor or your best friend or your daughter or your son. Um, make it a little festive. So I put a little arrangement on the table and it's surrounded with containers. I have a tendency to group a number of containers around the various sitting areas in my garden so that you can sit there and enjoy the beauty of them. It has to be more than just the work of taking care of them. And yes, it is work, but also the pleasure of doing it. And we would need to talk about sun and shade as we go through these pictures too, because there's a lot of confusion as to what plants do well in what circumstance. So, View your garden morning to evening and where do you get the sunshine and where do you have shade? Within my garden, I do not have absolute blasting sun all day long anywhere. And yet I succeed with many plants. Basically, those plants that when you buy them say sun will perform well as long as they get six to eight hours of direct sunshine. Those plants that say shade will love morning sun and dappled afternoon sun, but they really don't like the intense heat of the early afternoon sun. So there's the difference, okay? Many times you can use those sun plants as long as throughout the day, they're getting six to eight hours. So let's go to the next one. This was a, a fun thing that we did for our marketing department and, and the container is a Mexican container. Now talk about winter. Let's talk about containers for a second. This particular container will not thrive outside over winter. It is not fired well, it's beautiful, it's used as an accent among my other containers, but it is never left outside. And I learned that the hard way, okay? Um, but not, not to be planted with a perennial or something that you expect to live over. Empty the container out and take it inside in the winter time. All right, what's in this? Begonias, the wonderful, wonderful begonias that bloom throughout the season. This particular one is called selenia. There are different types of begonias, most of, or many of which need to have some shade in the heat of the day. This particular one will take afternoon sun as well as uh, shade. And so it's very versatile. There are those that are almost indistinguishable from this that um, can't, can't take that afternoon sun. So be very careful when you're buying your beautiful begonias that you know whether or not they can take the afternoon sun. Our regular bedding begonias, um, I prefer to use the dark leaf in full day sun and, and keep the green leaf for part shade. But I have seen landscapers who have used the green leaf even in full sun. So um, just be aware of the begonias and the type of begonia that you're buying. All of the bronze leaf begonias do well for me, even in full sun. But, uh, but some of the others you need to pay attention to. Now, very popular are the colocaceous, alocaceous, the elephant ear. These are smaller elephant ears. Although some of these can get five to six feet tall and be quite large and striking, really an, um, 
an emphasis in your garden, okay? It says, look at me, I'm huge. And they're beautiful as that upright within these containers. They will grow in full sun. I think they do better if they have a little bit of protection from the hottest afternoon sun, but certainly here at the garden center, we've had them survive and do quite well, even in full sun. But they do require not wet soil. None of these things, except the juncus that I showed you earlier, won't wet soil. So how do you water? You water deeply and thoroughly to be sure that all the soil in that pot is thoroughly wet. And then you don't water again until you check it and you say, hmm, that's getting a little dry. You don't want it to go bone dry. These are the things you have to watch when we get into the heat of summer, particularly if you've got a lot of sunshine. Let's go to the next one here. Okay, here are two plants that I just can't be without in my garden. The one, the one with the broad leaves is the dragon wing begonia. That's a green leafed begonia that does incredibly well in shade and blooms heavily all summer long. Requires very little deadheading. Sun, yes, but it will perform for you beautifully. For me, it doesn't like the hot afternoon sun. If I want that look and that size, because that one is at least two and a half feet tall. If I want that, I will choose the dark leaf um, called Whopper or Big, imaginative names, isn't it? Okay, the other container is Fuchsia Gartenmeister. And of that one will also bloom all summer long with minor deadheading. When you see little tiny seed pods on it, clip them off and that will keep it going. Now we'll talk a little bit more a little later in the program about this particular plant because it is a hummingbird magnet. Oh, I love it. And we're going to talk about some more hummingbird magnets. Now, here again, we talk about the upright plants and the filler plants and the spiller plants. Vinca, the Vinca annual, has both Vinca that are upright and those that are cascading. And actually into this particular container here at the garden center, I used the annual ornamental grass, Penicetum rubrum, and then I put a few of the upright vinca in here, and we're using the same color, put cascading in here. And that, that takes the heat. If you want a container that will take strong sun, that's it, okay? So vinca, it loves the heat. And here's another one that, that doesn't mind the heat. And this again is a container that makes a statement. It's using cannas, the dark leafed cannas in this instance. And it sort of connects with the dark color of the pot. So you have to kind of think about coordinating all your colors. So there are a lot of petunias in, in this particular one, okay? And they do incredibly well. Petunias are heavy feeders. And so there is now a fertilizer that is for petunias particularly. And really, if you use a liquid fertilizer every couple of weeks, boy, the petunias really do thrive. And in addition to the petunias cascading out, I have had incredible luck with the palabracoas also. And I believe there's a sweet potato line that's also cascading out of this. So this is, this is good for the heat in the summer. Yes. Okay, this one is just a little bit different, okay? I wanted to show you this, but it has vinca in it and it has a petunia cascading out, but in the top um, is, is one that is a child growing up, I called a, a bachelor button 
but it's truly a gumfrina. And the variety is pinball gumfrina. It sends up these tall, loose stems of a flower that feels dry when you touch it. And actually it is a wonderful, wonderful plant to cut for arranging and, and to dry in dried flowers. Just fantastic. And here's another really fun one that will grow in full sun. I think, I think that the geraniums sometimes do a little bit better if they have some dappled light in the hottest part of the day, but they certainly will grow there. So this is, is one of the heirloom geraniums because it has that fancy leaf that, and there are several different colors for those heirlooms and a beautiful different colors within the bloom, okay? But into that and weaving through the geranium is the euphorbia um, and cascading out the side is a, <laughs> is a plant that you'll either love or uh, hate one or the other. It's called Creeping Jenny, okay? And if it falls out of the pot onto the ground, you'll have a ground cover, but sometimes that's kind of pretty too. In fact, I have that going on near one of my sitting areas at home now. It dropped out of the pot and, and I have a, a part gravel, part flagstone area that we use as a sitting area in the outer part of the garden. And now there's a huge patch of this at the base of my cluster of, of containers. And it's really pretty attractive, you know, but it's easy to pull up. So don't panic, you know. Now here's another one that is using a, a colocasia and it is teacup. It has, it would, it holds a small amount of water. And actually it's kind of fun when it's raining because you can see it dip over and spill the water out, which is fun. And again, at the base of that is, um, I think a, a nice coordinating color because the color of the um, colocasia and the color of the container is similar. And then you've got this bright, wonderful vinca all around it. Okay. And going now into that area, <coughs> taken previously, not today, but this is the area that I was speaking about that is, I have a flagstone patio back here, but I enlarged it and um, just put random stones with the Seminole, the red Seminole chips. And it's been very satisfactory. And in that area, I have grouped aside from the sitting area, a number of pots and I'm planting that up as now. And uh, this is, was a couple of years ago. And it has, again, established colocasia. So you see some of them can get quite large. And um, there's also caladium in there. And I believe there's some of the dragon wing begonia and that wonderful grass that I just can't be without in the container and in the garden, Hakana Kloa. That's the yellow grass that you see. Now, one advantage of that is that it's such a wonderful contrast with the grassy look against that large leaf of both the palladium and the colocasia. And I believe there's some little strips of, of vinca um, trailing out on the other side that is a color pickup. And so you've got a lot of that nice, uh, bold, but soft yellow. It's not an in your face yellow. And so I kind of like that. And most of my containers back in this area are all terracotta. There are a few that uh, are in that dark brownish cast that goes well with the terracotta. And then I have these little round balls that, that accent that, I think. So I enjoy the groupings. And I think the next picture coming up is a complimentary one in that area. Again, this is where I said this year I had the uh, creeping Jenny that fell out of the pot. And now where you see the gravel there is all creeping Jenny. <laughs> And so you're, you're looking at this as a cover as if these pots are sitting among the 
creeping Jenny. And then you've got the creeping Jenny out of the pot. It's, it's fun. It's fun. So you might want to try something like that sometimes. It's, it's really pretty neat. Now, speaking of coordinating colors, you can certainly do that. And this is coordinating the color of the caladium with the New Guinea impatiens. And there are New Guinea impatiens that really don't like the afternoon sun. And there are the sun patients, which are New Guineas also, that do like the sunshine and will grow in either place. And so with the New Guineas, you can grow all of them in part shade, but the sun patients in afternoon sun, okay? And with that, again, is the little uh, wispy filler that's there, which is the euphorbia. And, uh, and it'll tolerate a lot of shade and still do well. I think in the pot next to that is some ivy, you know, looks like it is anyway, I can hardly see it. Okay, <laughs> next one. <laughs> now, this is again euphorbia with geraniums, but I showed you this picture because this is a plant that I love and can't be without either. And it is certainly one that cascades out of the pot and is grown primarily for its foliage. Uh, it's Dorotheanthus, Dorotheanthus. And it has a sweet little red blossom on it, but it's the foliage that's important. And the next one there. Yes, here's another. This is the Euphorbia with a color combination, picking up the, the Gartenmeister fuchsia and the New Guinea impatience. Now let's come back to me for just a moment, Danny, or actually it may be more than a moment. We need to talk about, if I, if you'll excuse my back for a second, we need to talk about nature and the hummingbirds and what you enjoy and how you want to support um, the birds, bees, and butterflies, and I certainly do. And I have a large garden, so I have the ability to do that. And there are some new plants on the market now that I, I would like to introduce you to if you have not met them. I have a wonderful front porch that I love to sit with my morning cup of coffee. And I also enjoy occasionally a glass of wine sitting there quietly in the evening. And that's primarily when the hummingbirds come, early in the morning and late in the evening. And there's no such thing as wanting to share with these hummingbirds, not in my garden anyway, because the ones that hang out in the back try to come to the front and the front ones are in the way, okay? So it's kind of fun to watch them chasing each other. I have a number of pots uh, above the wall in the distance from me. And they're all planted now with plants that attract hummingbirds because I keep them all summer long. What are some of those plants? One, and it doesn't look like much in here, but when it's coming out of those containers, it, well, it's called, would you believe they named it Hummingbirds Lunch? right? <laughs> and the other name is cigar flower, which is just not very telling, you know. And, and it is uh, <laughs> vermilion. It has little cigar looking blooms on it, but the hummingbirds absolutely love that, okay? Wonderful, wonderful plant. Now, there is a whole series of these Salvias. Salvia is an incredible plant to attract the hummingbirds. All of these attract butterflies also. This is purple and bloom salvia. And it gets quite tall, two and a half feet, center of the containers, and has this intense purplish bloom on it. Blooms all summer long. You do need to deadhead periodically. There are side shoots coming here, so it has been pinched, which is good, 
because that sends out more on the side that will set blooms. They come to this religiously. When it's finished, trim that back to heal and let all the others continue to bloom. Close relative to that, let me see, I think is in here. This one is called Amistad, A M Amistad, A M I S T A D. You see how tall it is already. And it's almost a black purpley bloom. There are reds among these. There's a soft blue among these. These are all very tall plants. Then here is one that sometimes can be in the ground. In fact, some of these plants, if they're planted in the ground, might overwinter, might. But in containers, that's questionable. This one is salvia and it's called hot lips. It's very, very red. And it doesn't have to be red. They love all of these plants that they can get their little thin beaks into and um, get nectar from. And so I know that they will visit all of these, the red, the purples, all of them, okay? So investigate because there are even more varieties of this. Oh, this one's called Rockin' Fuchsia. All of these get big. They are salvias. We consider them annual salvias right now. There are a lot of perennial salvias too. But I love to grow the annuals because they continuously bloom all summer long. The perennial salvias have an intense period of bloom. You need to cut them back and then they'll have another intense. But usually in most of my containers, I like the plants that's gonna bloom all through the season, unless I'm planting it for color, like I would if I put a hosta or I put a um, a Carl Bells, that's fine, okay? And they'll live over in a good sized container. But rockin' fuchsia. Visit our fuchsia department because I think it's pretty exciting. And I'm very pleased to be trying a number of these. Then this one has been around for a while, but and they are wonderful too. This one is called the Jewel Series of Salvia comes in red, white, pink, but it also has that little funnel flower that the little beak can get down into. Fun, fun, fun. So we're putting together colors that are kind of fun here. The purple's looking good with the pinks. They love petunias and I love the solid color of the list, but I also love the smaller contrasting color of the Calabrocoa. So we're kind of putting together this container now. Okay, it's gonna hold all of these plants in it. And that's probably enough, you know. But if you got carried away or you didn't like one or the other of these, then let's take this one away and put in one that the hummingbirds love. And oh my goodness, <laughs> so do the butterflies. You cannot be planting uh, this whole antenna. And there are some beautiful colors in this now. And the pinks, which would look lovely with this particular salvia, or even this one, there's a wonderful contrast here. So lantana is another big one that you could go for. And here is a small plant of that Gartenmeister fuchsia. Now it's very red. It's, it has that funnel flower that the hummingbirds love and it, it wonderful blooms all summer, sun or shade. Very nice. So I introduced you to just a few of the absolute favorites of uh, the hummingbird plants. And I hope you'll visit the salvia area and ask us about those plants that do well in that situation. Okay, let's go back to the pictures, Dan. <laughs> okay, next one up. Okay, there again is that gumfrina that I mentioned earlier. 
It's a beautiful little purple flower that I absolutely love. And it is also a wonderful contrast to the other plants, which is why I love it. Um, you want to coordinate colors that look good together and shapes that are good together and contrasts. The, the, this is good. Now, there is um, gray in this, and all of the dusty millers will give you a nice contrast of color. Gray complements almost any color you put it with, you know? It's really good. Uh, that particular one is angel wings, but I have discovered that the needs of the angel wings vary a little bit from the needs of some of the other plants. And you have to recognize what those needs are in some of the individual plants. And so I found that this one really definitely needs to be planted. Well, the Freda would work well because it would take some dry because that that particular angel wing does not want to be wet all the time. And, and maybe let's uh, diverge a little bit and come back to me again for a second. Talking about things that cascade and that are different um, and not necessarily flowers because the gray in that and the dusty miller is definitely not grown for flowers. It's grown for the color and the contrast. Here is a plant that I've used a lot of last year and overwintered beautifully. And now it's cascading. There's a wall above where these containers are. And it's really cascading and coming down even out of the pot and down in front of the wall. And it is just incredible. It's Sedum Angelina, Sedum Angelina. And it's beautiful in the ground or in that container and as the one that cascades to complement. And it's not a yellow that screams at you. It's a soft yellow that says, look at me, but it doesn't scream. This is a little bit brighter and, and really is, is pretty decent size. It grows up a little bit, but it cascades out also. And it's a Duranta, D-U-R-A-N-T-A, Duranta. Very nice. Actually, these could be grown together, cascading out of the container, okay? Did I have another different salvia in here? That's rockin' deep purple. That'll be fun. Yes. And I'm out, and here's another one. That, here's the Dusty Miller. See? This kind of cascades too, grows up. It cascades a bit, but it's just, look at the contrast here very attractive with the gray and the purple. And I love the contrast again, as I said, with those petunias. I love to do the, the royal purple with this particular one, which let me remind the bar. Oh, it's Supertunia Bordeaux. The Supertunias do not have to be deadheaded. And, and that's a big advantage. Surfina and the Supertunias do not have to be dedicated. They are sterile, they will not succeed. But look at the contrast with that. I, th I find that quite attractive. And I also like the contrast with the gold, with the gold or with the gray. It's, it's, it's good. Here's one that we didn't talk about with the uh, hummingbirds. And this is a plant that's in the perennial section and in the annual section. And it's quasi, has been quasi perennial for me. A lot of other people have had luck with it. It's called agastache, A-G-A-S-T-A-C-H-E, agastache. Sometimes called hyssop, H-Y-S-S-O-P, hyssop. But this is very attractive too. I, you do have to deadhead this and then it will continue to bloom, okay? So we talked about a little bit more than the cascaders there. So let's go, go on with these uh, pictures, Danny. The next one, there we go. All right, I talk about my various sitting areas. You saw one sitting area earlier. This is the sitting area just below my deck and my back garden. And I mentioned to you about Hakanakloa, the grass the golden grass that's actually variegated. I don't know if you can tell that it's variegated. 
are in some large pots. Let's talk about the size of pots. Most of my pots are a minimum of 16 inches because I don't have time to baby little pots and I'm at work a lot. So um, I use the larger pots and most of these things stay out all winter because I have too many pots to gather up and dig inside, okay. They are terracotta, which is well-fired terracotta. I will lose one every now and then. Never ever leave your pots sitting on bare soil over winter and never leave a saucer under them. I do use saucers in the summertime when because they don't collect enough water to be a problem when I'm watering them and it's hot, they'll use up that water quickly and you don't have to worry about uh, mosquitoes. And, and let me mention quickly, okay, that I put out containers that hold water and I put mosquito bits and, and, and or mosquito dunk, depending upon the size of the container. And that helps with keeping down the mosquitoes. It may not get rid of all of them, but when the adults lay in there, it kills the eggs. It's organic. It doesn't hurt the birds, the bees, and the butterflies, nor you, okay. Um, let's go through these fairly quickly because I would like to leave a few minutes for questions. Okay, another grouping there. I have a lot of blue containers because I love blue. And, and there's Broelia, the blue in there. There is a variegated, uh, you can see the red one. I will point that out. It is a variegated New Guinea patience, and boy, does it thrive. Let's go through these again, changing it up. I love to change it up every year. And I've used part of the accent and this one is the spider plant, okay? Let's go through, okay. Okay, I do wanna to mention to you that this is an area, half of that patio on the one side that gets the most sun, afternoon sun, are, is my herb garden. I moved a lot of herbs into containers because it's just outside my back kitchen door. And I love to be able to step out there and use all these herbs, okay? Yes, so you can see I've taken them all inside. I do use them a great deal in cooking. And um, I plant nasturtiums, I plant marigolds. They're all edible, although I'm not fond of the flavor of the marigold, but I love the impatience, but they are so pretty to decorate with. Now, I have to show you one that I did many years ago in the next picture, because this introduces two or three really interesting plants. The gray one that you see there is dichondra, D-I-C-O-N-D-R-A, dichondra. And the kind of fuzzy one that you see is a lotus vine. All of them cascade. And then there's a, a golden looking one that is the variegated um, selenium. It is not, it's staged with the potato vines, but it's not a true potato vine, okay? So those are some beautiful cascaders. And to sort of wrap up the picture thing, uh, when we go to this one, like here again, I can't do any seminar without saying, introduce the children, introduce them not to weeding, introduce them to something they will enjoy. And, and certainly in the summertime, they enjoy wetting themselves as well as the plants, okay? So that's my Eamon when he was small, helping me out here at the garden center in reality. All righty, Danny, we've finished up with the pictures. So let's talk very briefly about the planting up the container and then I will hopefully have a moment for just a few questions. A decent sized container, unless you're gonna really watch over it, has to have drainage. I always cut a piece of landscape fabric and we have cut it into small sections out in our annual section so that you don't have to buy a whole roll of it, okay? And that I put in the bottom always. That helps to keep the soil in the pot and not on your deck or whatever. 
And then I use a good potting soil. I have the, uh, Danny, if you want to hand me the Maryfield um, potting soil. We formulated our own a number of years ago. Uh, the Maryfield potting soil is excellent. For those of you who want, um, did I bring it up? Yeah, I just brought little bags because I could handle them. There are those that are all organic if you really want to go that route and excellent. Not all potting soils are created equal, but the Espoma, uh, Fox Farm, um, Maryfield, several of them are excellent. When I'm filling my container, I will fill it to within maybe three inches of the top. You don't ever want to fill your soil all the way to the top. It is just really hard to water it if you do that, okay? So I will put my soil in, put my plants in, arranging them as I want them to be, fill in the soil around them so that I'm holding it back a good inch to inch and a half. And on top of that, I will, because I have squirrels, and squirrels love to dig in fresh soil. Plus, because I was trying to keep the squirrels out of my containers, I also discovered that by placing fine gravel, and this happens to be one that I easily picked up in the greenhouse, and it's pea gravel, but usually I use the small river jacks, and I'm particularly fond of, even though it's a little more expensive, I'm particularly fond of the Seminole chips because they're a little rough, but they're three eighths inch. They're small. Pea gravel or three eighths inch Seminole chips or river jacks. And I place those a good half an inch all around the top after I've planted my plants. Now, as I said, this discourages the squirrels digging in it, but when you water, it doesn't splash the soil out all over everything because I have too many containers to go around with a watering can. I don't do that, okay? I water with a hose. I don't have a system. I've got too many plants for that. And it does not wash the soil out of the pot. So I find using that gravel is wonderful. Now, one kind of final thing that I would like to say about um, the containers is everybody has problems with the deer. And I do want to emphasize that I have major problems with deer. And so I am an advocate of using the deer repellents appropriately. And in the spread, this one is Bobex, and I've used it for years. It doesn't wash off in a rain. It usually will last three or four weeks without having an issue, except in the springtime when things are growing rapidly. For instance, I absolutely love my lilies, my oriental lilies, day lilies, several other things. And if you go out, you're anticipating these blooms and you go out in the morning and choo, it's gone. No, you have to spray a little more often with the bobex. Now, some people also enjoy using liquid fence and some people like to alternate. I haven't had to do that. I've used this consistently and it has worked for me. So I love it. Things need to be fertilized. There's organic fertilizers and I use Garden Tone in, in my uh, vegetables. I use Plantone according to the directions. I mix it thoroughly in that soil before I plant. This will last for a while, but it won't last forever because you're watering all the time and you're washing those nutrients out. So you need to replace those nutrients. And there is, a, again, Fox Farm makes one that you can liquid fertilize and use periodically. 
and uh, with herbs and things, they don't need a whole lot of fertilization. So I don't worry so much about that. And I may just sprinkle some more plantain and water that in and they're fine. But petunias are heavy feeders and now Jack's Classic puts out a petunia feed. I haven't used it, but I'm going to use it this year to see what happens. Normally, I like to use, because it's easy, uh, the liquid fertilizer. This one is the Blossom Booster. It's 10, 30, 20. And I like to use that every couple of weeks. Just watch your plants. If they're thriving, you know, maybe you don't have to fertilize that often, but generally speaking, about every two weeks, it needs to be fertilized. I think I've covered the basics, Sally, and, and I haven't left my time for questions, but uh, we'll take a few. Thanks, Peg. All right, yeah, we have some questions. So a quick reminder to everybody. Um, if you, so we're gonna be trying to focus on stuff that covers kind of a broader range just so we can meet most people's questions. If we're not able to get to your question today, please feel free to follow up with me after class. Just hit reply on that confirmation email. I'll forward it to someone, Peg, our plant clinic, someone who can actually answer your question um, so that we can get you the information that you need. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and launch in. Uh, the first question is something that I couldn't answer, and I know we were talking about this before class. So just real quick, what is the name of that cute plant in the little face planter, the little head? Sorry, I'm like pointing my mouse at it. It's the spiral juncus, J U N C. Spiral juncus. All right, spiral, thank you. Yeah, it looks like my curly hair when I don't have it tied down. <laughs> I love that plant. I know we were talking about it right before class. Um, all right, so the next question is about soil and containers. So, do you need to replenish soil in containers during the summer? Um, if so, how often? This that's an excellent question. I do not replace all of my soil every year. I can't afford to do that. I have far more containers than I even want to admit, okay? Uh, because I like to try all things. I like to have an answer for people and the best that I possibly can. And so it's important to grow different things from time to time. It's not just for my pleasure, which is a lot, but um, it's a learning curve too. I am in the process now of redoing a number of those containers. And I, it's very important because this potting soil over time settles down. So it's important. And I have one of these wonderful things that, that I encourage you to buy if you don't have, because it's number one, made in America. It's, uh, what is the name of this thing? It's Cox, uh, Wilcox, W-I-L-C-O-X. Wilcox all pro. I can pry with this. It's not just a little short one, but I can get down into those containers and loosen that soil, really loosen it up. And then I add maybe 25 or 30% fresh soil because it will have settled anyway. And I work that all in together and I reuse that soil. The only time that I don't reuse that soil is if maybe I had a plant that was sick, okay, which I haven't had to worry about, or tomatoes perhaps uh, that don't like to be grown in the same soil for two or three years in a row. And I th actually think this is the third year for this because I have them in huge containers and um, I didn't replace it this year either. And it's looking very good, okay? So no, I do not replace all my soil, but I am very sure that I get down in there and I loosen that soil before I replant and add enough extra that it's going to be well aerated, okay? And that it's going to drain well. So no, I reuse my soil, I do. Thanks, Peg. All right, the next question is about um, trailing plants. So if your trailing plants get too large, they start spilling over onto the deck or onto the ground. Um, should you be trimming these back periodically to keep them from thinning out at the base of the plant or just from getting too large? Are there any? Absolutely. And uh, all the sweet potato vines are notorious for that. I mean, they, they can take over your entire deck if you're not careful. <laughs> So no, by all means, go in and prune in shape. And sometimes pruning is, is very important. And how you do that is also important. 
And here again, my old Joyce Chin scissors, which I didn't bring the others up, is, well, I'm not gonna open it, but they're fantastic, okay? Great for trimming. You can see that there's little tiny blooms forming here. So when you cut this one back or you're trimming something else or shaping a plant like this, you come and cut just above the next set of leaves. That's the best way to do it. Trim all the way back. And when I deadhead things, even like the petunias, when I'm deadheading, rather than pulling this bloom off, I will go back and pinch that off right there. Okay. Hopefully that was easy to that's helpful, thank you. Um, here's a question about some of the different container materials. Um, pots that are made of ceramic or terracotta or plastic, do any of these differ in water absor absorption? I've heard that terracotta, for instance, will soak up some of the water that's meant for the plants. I love my terracotta because I get really good drainage from them. And yes, yes, definitely there is a difference. Certainly the plastic holds water longer than the terracotta. I don't want to say that the terracotta uses water that the plants need. I'm just going to say terracotta is porous. Therefore, it loses water a bit faster, okay, than either ceramic or plastic, okay. Thanks, Peg. Um, okay, so for perennials, if you plant them in a container, will they come back each year? Generally speaking, they will if that container is large enough. I use in my shady areas, I love the accents of hosta. I love, um, in fact, they do better for me in containers than they do in the ground, the carl bells, the hookara, okay? It's, it's a beautiful accent. And the grasses that I showed you in that one picture that were quite large, they've been in that container for two or three years. In reality, I should get them out of the containers this year and, and cut them and, and separate them out because they've gotten so big, okay? And how would I even do that? I have a butcher knife that is so sturdy and I often just cut with that. Or sometimes I'll go in with my Felco pruners and very carefully snip down with that. In fact, if you buy one of the large ferns in a pot, um, you can slip it out and uh, loosen up all those roots and often cut it in half and use it in two different containers. I love ferns in containers too. And I use a lot of perennial ferns in there and they're beautiful and yes, they do live over. They live over because my pots are large. Thanks, Peg. Okay, here's a here's actually a really interesting question um, I haven't thought about before. Um, okay, so if, um, this person planted some containers after your spring class. Yes. So she wanted to know about um, when she's planting plants that spread like a wave petunia or mint, yeah. should you put stones on the top of those containers or should you leave the stones off given the way that the plants grow? Well, the stone doesn't affect either one of them in reality for me, uh, unless you put an awful lot of stone, you know, they do, they do quite well. Um, and you don't have to do the stone. Uh, it's, I just have found that I enjoy doing that because of the squirrels. Now, once, once that soil settles in and the plants grow over it, the squirrels don't seem to bother it, you know, but when it's fresh planted, I can go out there and discover these plants outside the pot, you know, which is very discouraging. Oh, squirrels. Oh, man. Um, all right. Here's a <laughs> um, all right. Here's a question about the hummingbird plants you've shown. Um, we have a few questions on those. Do those plants need full sun or can any of them get away with shade part shade? A lot of them can get away with shade part shade. The salvias are going to do much better. They, as I said, they really do need six to eight hours of full sun, okay? I have some that are in a little shadier spots. They still bloom well, but not as prolifically, okay? 
I think that the Agastache does a little bit better with less, okay? And, and the, um, the Vermilion, uh, Kufia, Kufia Vermilion does reasonably well with less sun. Here's the thing. I'm not talking about deep shade here because they will not grow well in deep shade. Very few things grow well in deep shade. There I go often with color of plants, whether it be hosta or hookara or some of those things with begonias in where it gets a lot of shade. When you're in doubt, try it. Just try it. You won't know until you do. And this is why I'm sitting here today, is because I've tried it. I would have to tell you, I've, I've killed my share of plants. Yep, I have. <laughs> but um, if you like a particular plant and you know you've got a decent amount of sun, give it a try. Okay. Thanks, Peg. Um, all right, it looks like we've got about time for one more question. So here's one I think will be of interest. Do you, do you have any general rules of thumb for checking, making sure that you're getting a container that's big enough to fit all of the plants that you want to plant in it? Well, now, um, you would have to be sure you got space in there to do that, okay? Um, I'm saying to you, if you want some of these containers like you just saw in these pictures, you've got to go 16 inches or bigger. A 12 inch, 14 inch. I've used some 14 inch uh, terracotta, but that's not good. Maybe three plants in there, okay? Uh, sometimes I plant more plants than it really needs uh, because I, I want all these plants up there for these hummingbirds or whatever. But judge, you know how, what your container size is. And if you're using these little four and a half inch pots, you can only fit so many in there, okay? So you just got to try to work that out. Uh, Angelonia is another fun one, and that's a nice tall one, and it complements also these fuchsias. But how many plants can you get in there, okay? Let's do the cascading uh, petunia here with that one. And then I'm going to overcrowd this because I want to do it. I'm going to put this in. That's more than enough, that's enough for a 16 inch container. And how many plants? That's five, okay. And you don't really have to have that many because this gets pretty big. But I'm impatient sometimes. <laughs> I always overstuff my containers too when I plant them. So. <laughs> okay. so anyway, I hope that that has been helpful to you and perhaps I've introduced you to a few new plants because they're new ones every year. And, uh, and it's a complete learning curve being out there. You have no idea. You know, you can come in and you can ask the questions and what about this plant and what about this plant? And, and sometimes you just have to say, well, I think this is going to do so-and-so because you haven't grown it. You can't grow everything out there. And every year you're getting new plants, which is very exciting. And so sometimes you just have to say, I'm going to try that because I like the looks of it, you know. Definitely. Yeah. It's a fun world. It needs to be fun. Get out there. Put on your sombrero. <laughs> and get into the garden. <laughs> Thank you, Peggy. <laughs> um, all right, we're about out of time. Um, so I just have a couple of quick notes before we conclude. Um, I was having a conversation with someone via chat and it goes along with what Peg was saying just now. Um, so if you guys have questions, if you want to grow a container and you need any help, our annuals department, um, Peg, uh, we have a lot of other people at other stores, uh, Peg's at Bear Oaks, but we're happy to help you. I'm saying we, it wouldn't be me, I'm not the person, but someone in annuals, they're happy to help you make selections. Um, one person said they were terrified of coordinating colors. They can help you with that. Um, they can provide good advice. So please feel free to come into the store or to contact us, bring photos if you have special containers you wanna fill. We're happy to help you all with that. Um, quick reminder, 
There is going to be a survey going out tomorrow, along with a coupon, a copy of the recording, and Peg's outline. So if you haven't received that yet, it's going to go out tomorrow in an email. Um, and this, if you guys can take a few minutes to fill out the survey, that's really helpful. Um, so that's about all. Peg, is there anything you would like to close with before we wrap up? No, it, it's just get outside and love it, you know? Definitely. Yeah, everybody. Definitely. We look forward to seeing you all in the Garden Center. Have fun. Um, and everybody have a great day. Thank you, Peggy. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.